Krakow up here. She's our Featured Reader Coordinator. Um, she is going to introduce our Featured Reader. And this is a webinar tonight. So um, we've got Nicole and uh, Tracy, uh, and Julie's gonna facilitate that. She'll introduce Nicole and Tracy and, and kind of operate those questions. And, and Julie is an editor and works at uh, Roundabout Bookstore. So she's got some insight into the, the writing world as well. So this should be a pretty good conversation. And I think we could, can we just ask questions to them from verbally from here? Okay, and if you're at home, um, put questions in. Is there a Q&A or a chat or both? There's a Q&A and a chat if you're at home. And so, um, uh, Julie, are you monitoring that or is, should we have Paige monitor the, the Q&A? The no, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping track of it. Okay, cool. All right, well, here's Mary. Thank you, Mike. So I'm the featured reader coordinator and every month I um, encourage somebody to come to our group and, and read. This is weird having my back to the, to the head. Okay. So um, tonight we have Andrew J. Smiley. He is a middle school language arts teacher and resident of Central Oregon for the last decade with his wife and three children. When he is not trying to save worlds through the written word, he can be found watching anime, playing video games, exploring dark corners, and tinkering with gunplay models. Welcome, Andrew Smiley. All right, thanks, Mary, very much. Uh, quick sound check, can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. So I'm also really grateful for the telecommunications because our whole house is down with COVID right now. So I'm hoping that um, my croaky voice will lend an ominous you know, tone to the reading. So just like, if you can get rid of my image and just paste in a picture of James Earl Jones or something, that'd be great. Uh, I am reading tonight from my young uh, YA fantasy series. This is from the second novel. Currently working on this chapter is entitled Grimoire. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> try to do this without sniffing. The ebony tower was usually subdued this time of night. So when the morning star came shearing in through the security screen of his offices, the startled subdemon on watch sprang to its feet, instantly stif stiffening into the prescribed posture of attention. Hail, my fell lord. Ignoring the croaked pleasantry, the dark administrator of the operations division of Sistema Pandemonium swept into the rooms. <laughs> He cast a quick look around to see that his furnishings were exactly as he liked them before descending upon his desk and tossing a pair of fire-scribed tablets onto the smooth black surface. Rounding the desk, the black-robed minister of the infernal realm began manipulating the data wall behind his workspace. Pulling a cipher chip from the safety of his garnet red vest, he plugged it into the service port and gutted its contents, then crushed the chip underfoot. <clears throat> Uncertain whether to resume its tiny workstation or wait for further orders, the subdemon cleared its throats cautiously and readied itself to shrink back from a white-hot lash of flame. Hush, came the baritone admonition as the minister's quick fingers manipulated several complex sequences of commands and a series of files unfolded across the obsidian screen. I will have the use for you soon, Mott. Several minutes passed as the minister, or as the master, mined through the information. From what the subdemon could tell from a couple of hesitant glances, the data wall was digesting the substance of an ancient tome of records. Odd engines of infernal geometry and grim diagrams crafted by the elders long ago. At some length, the minister nodded slowly, finally satisfied with what he was seeing. He stepped back from the data wall, leaving the system to continue processing the deep scan and replication processes, and settled himself leisurely into his command cradle. Keying up the surveillance network, he opened a broad panorama of observation windows that knitted together in the static space around the black throne like chair, checking the feeds on his many assets. Is it a success then, Master? Mott finally ventured, pressing its small taloned fingers together. The minister's hot, or dark, hot eyes shifted to his subordinate, as if finally recognizing the subdemon's presence. He leaned forward, steepling his fingers and tapping them against his neat spike of beard. Yeah, successful, yes. More than a temporary creature like you could know. Mott bowed and said, Any boon for pandemonium and its minions pleases me, master. 
a dry chuckle across the warm air. You are a clever one, Imp, asking without the words. What news have you for me? The subdemon whirled back to the small podium of the workstation, flicking the images of the three bits of correspondence that had come in during its shift, each becoming a small kernel of brimstone that magnified its contents in the air. A response from Prince Asmodeus to your inquiry about the financial disposition of his court. Research findings on Project Capricorn, Director Paimon's team in the Phlegethon Alchemy Crucible. And Prince Moloch has requested a meeting. He has compiled a report on the recent Seraphim attack on his fortress and the damage to Gehenna and its cauldrons. He seeks for a full reconstruction assessment from the Mammon Consortium. Seems it will be a year before Machina Exitium has no care for Arachiel's pet projects. The Dark Minister cut his subordinate off. He should have known better than to collude with Baron Mulciber without the foresight of a release of liability first. But the hold of Gehenna is a substantial resource node. Again, the fingers tapped at the dark beard. Trouble me with this tomorrow. The Prince of Sacrifice will have to wait. I have bigger patterns to resolve. Of course. Mott scooped the brimstone graphics back into its podium. Recent initiates, even ones as clever and enterprising as this one, were not afforded the luxury of a gender. But if it were not so, Mott's preference would have been for a smooth and pacifying female's voice. A knowing smile crossed the morning star's fine chiseled face. You'd like to know, wouldn't you? What the grimoire we schemed so carefully for says, Mott failed immediately at hiding the pretense of interest. I would not presume. Of course you would. The minister rose, and with a chuckle and a swirl of smoky garments, gestured grandly back at the imagery processing on the data wall. Just as you would look to steal glimpses when my back would be turned. <clears throat> this is what makes you useful, after all, your lust to know. The minister crooked a finger, the long black hair falling past his ear and over the shoulder of his robes. Because I am feeling particularly proud of this acquisition, and because you have such little effect on the grand schema, I shall tell you. This, my dear Mott, he pointed to the digital images of ancient codex, cycling one after another into view, and then into the secure memory vault, is the key is the lost key of Solomon's console. A record of demon kind and their progenitors, back to the time when the Pale Empress herself was spewed out of paradise. It has spent a very long season indeed, locked away behind the high walls and the piercing rays of the damned Seraphim organization. However, thanks in part to roles played by our grim Prince Moloch and certain others, it is back home where it has always belonged. Wonderful news, Master, a tribute to your brilliance. Mott edged its eyes carefully up to the gauge the minister's expression. Though I might imagine that Prince Malthus must be quite upset at having lost the use of another ego splinter. A slow chuckle from the infernal executive. Yes, well, he will have to suffer a slight depreciation of his intellect as the price paid for a victory here. He gave it of himself willingly. Thankfully, we still retain all the information gathered from his proxy while it was functioning within Uriel's angel familia. That's the thing about demons. They serve us. The Grigori they must be content with what they have allotted. The dark eyes narrowed as the cascade of pages continued by on the black screen. Even the Fey Empress rules at our pleasure. She thinks she commands Eden, consorting with our brother Samael, whom she calls her dear King Baal. But it is a contrived alliance designed to serve the needs of pandemonium, as are you. Of course, my master. I revel in your, save your adulation for now, Mott. Simply let me indulge your curiosity for a bit. The master watched keenly as the dodecahedral core of the grimoire's digital materials spun slowly at the far left of his display, flakes peeling off its faces and resolving into the pages of the ancient record's sacred text. He glanced back down at his servant. What was lost has now been found. Nothing is ever lost but through ignorance. If the information of a thing has been recorded, then it may be recalled beyond life, beyond death, beyond the veil of absolution. Another look up into the grimoire's pages. We have here the architect's very toolbox before us, Mott. 
a thing I think might make even Moloch's losses easier for him to bear. Tell me, he glanced down into the subdemon's blank expression. Are you familiar with the proverb of the kingdom lost because of the farrier's nail? I understand mankind's axioms have been a great favorite pastime of your previous posting with the watchers. Mott nodded, twisting the horns of its thumbs together as it thought carefully. Yes, I remember it, my lord. A causality chain of catastrophe. A single horseshoe nail lost eventually leads to disaster for the nation. The minister circled around to the front of his black desk, smiling at some private humor as his long fingers plied into his vest again. The very same. But you see, dear Paige, that the nail doesn't matter, nor the horse, nor even the rider. Not really. It is a simple thing. It is a simple enough thing to get a fresh horse or send it to a rider. It is the message that matters most. His hard eyes bored down into the subdemon's blank face, a twisted caricature of humanity. <clears throat> a letter that makes its way to the king so that the king may develop deploy his forces correctly to win the battle and safeguard his kingdom. It is the information, the ability to discern the best choice to be made, how to move the resources and the forces of arms in the proper way to assure victory. The most important thing is, and always has been, the knowledge. The minister checked the face of his underling again. If you have control of the knowledge, then you would have all that you need. Do you understand, Mott? Subdemon tried not to nod too eagerly. I believe so, my lord. This grimoire adds to our knowledge, and this knowledge increases our power. Crudely put, but adequate, the minister glanced up at the graven image of the great seal above the busy data wall, the black tree growing downward into the motto, as above, so below. Yes, Mott, the key of Solomon's consul brings power, but its greater purpose will be to redistribute that power in our favor. Just as the enemy have their means of saving the particular souls of their chosen ones, so too do we again. We need not say goodbye to those we lose in this perennial conflict. Glory to the hosts and halls of the darkness, my lord, said Mott. I worship thy truths. Truth is simply a subset of a more complete knowledge. And now, my good and faithful servant, the morning star brought his hand up to Mott's shoulder, turning a smile down to its face as he slipped a chip of violet crystal out of a vest pocket and into a small socket at the back of the subdemon's collar. Let's tidy up that fine memory of yours. Oblivion began soaking into the edges of Mott's vision as it looked up into the face of the dark minister, recognizing just for an instant the timeless, formless malevolence ringing the black eyes. As the master's face drew closer, there could be seen a war of fire and ice raging between the tiny seams of his skin before everything went black and silent. End. <clears throat> Nice job, Andrew. Those are some well-developed bad guys you got working there. I'm looking looking forward to reading that one. Yeah, it's coming um, up next. All right, keep me posted. Um, uh, Mary uh, Krakow, who introduced Andrew tonight, is our featured reader coordinator. And, and if you are interested in reading at one of the meetings, um, you can email her at Mary Krakow, M-A-R-Y. K-R-A-K-O-W at gmail.com. Or if you're sitting in this room, you can just go over to Mary and say, hey, Mary, I'm interested in reading and she'll get your information. Uh, also, for those of you in this room, um, Amanda just brought us some lovely snacks in the back of the room. And so uh, feel free, uh, those of you at home have to get your own snacks, but uh, for anyone in this room here, feel free to get up at any time and, and grab something to eat. Um, and I am just gonna pass it off to Julie at this point. So Andrew, I think if you turn your camera off, you'll disappear from the webinar, but you'll still be able to see it. There we go. Um, and Julie, are you there? Uh, 
So she just said, I'll be right back on. Zoom had just had an issue. So, um, so what we're gonna do while we wait for Julie is we're gonna have Nicole and Tracy do a little self-introduction. Um, and if Julie pops back in in the meantime, then I'll let her take over. Um, so Nicole, let's start with you. And tell us a little bit about your workshop this morning too. Okay, hi, hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, great job to Andrew. I was just saying it's hard to read work out loud. It's such a vulnerable thing. So I really appreciated that. So, so my name is Nicole Meyer. It's so nice to be invited to this. I've lived in Central Oregon for close to 20 years now. Um, I am the author of three women's fiction novels. Uh, one is hybrid press and two are traditional press. And I'm also a newly certified book coach and developmental editor. So I kind of wear all different hats. Um, my workshop this morning, Mike was actually um, in that vein, uh, just getting people started more of the prep work before they dive into their novel. I mostly focus on fiction with my book coaching, um, but it's something that I wish I had when I was writing my novels, someone to really kind of go alongside me from concept to pitch. And so I was thrilled when I found out about the certification program and just working with authors has been the highlight of my past couple of years. So thank you. All right, Tracy. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks so much for asking me to be here this evening. Um, and yeah, good job to Andrew. I've actually been able to escape doing any reading out loud myself. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, so I, uh, let's see, I published my debut novel last year, uh, We Are the Brennans. And uh, it was a kind of went traditional. It was a uh, Celadon, which is an imprint of uh, Macmillan. And uh, I've lived in Bend for about seven years, uh, probably going on eight soon. And uh, most of that time, I've just kind of steeped myself in, in, in my work full time. Before that, we had a business and lots of things going on. And so this uh, move here kind of allowed me to jump in full time. And um, yeah, I have a, another, uh, my second book will be out next year. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about my process or whatever's useful to everybody. All right. I bet Julie has a whole bunch of questions. There she is. <laughs> there she is. Can you hear me, Julie? Oh, Hi. Me. Sorry. Yes. All right. All right. I'm going to let you take over. <laughs> Nicole and Tracy just introduced themselves. So you're now the Thank boss. You. Okay. <laughs> So unfortunately, this is the second time this has happened with my new laptop. And it seems that when I'm um, muted for a certain amount of time, my computer then thinks that something is wrong with my microphone and just kicks me off of Zoom. Oh. So I don't enjoy that. Um, thank you both <laughs> then for introducing yourselves. Um, I will say though, um, as Paige mentioned, I have brought copies of both of these wonderful ladies um, books from Roundabout that I will have down in the Brooks room um, right after we're done for sale. Um, I had brought some of Shay Earnshaw's books, but her schedule uh, got a little tricky with her joining us tonight. So again, I really want to thank both Tracy and Nicole, um, especially Nicole for um, being so gracious to answer my email when I was like, we need a panelist. And she had this workshop at roundabout this morning. So I knew that she, you know, had stuff going on. Um, when I originally thought of this panel, it was very, um, selfish because I have met both Tracy and Nicole and Shay and Sarah Smith um, through events at the bookstore. And I love how many amazing authors live here in Central Oregon. And I really felt like maybe not everyone knew about all of these amazing authors that are in Central Oregon. So I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you to this guild. Um, and hopefully pick your brain a little bit. So Tracy, let's go ahead and start with you. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your publishing journey, how, how you went from 
I wrote a manuscript to, I have this lovely, glorious book that I have read and you and I have talked about on several occasions and is just fantastic. Um, but just give us a little bit of background. Okay, yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, let's see. So I guess what I would start with, I did have a, a manuscript that I was working on that one for quite a long time. Um, I did a two year program through, it's an online novel writing program through Stanford. And I worked on Brennan's uh, for quite a bit of that program and workshopped it. And, um, and basically at the end of the program, a few of us uh, decided to attend the Kauai Writers Conference that year, which is a fairly big one. Um, every year is the first one I went to. Um, and I did not attend with any uh, hope of actually landing an agent. I just wanted the experience and connect with other writers. And there were some really interesting workshops and panels. Um, but I did have the opportunity to book a session with the woman who is now my agent, Stephanie Cabot. And again, I did not, uh, I'm not really a salesman and I'm not a good pitcher and I didn't really uh, expect to come away with that, but I did see it as an opportunity to get feedback from her. And instead of pitching her, really, I actually presented her because we were in person, uh, a copy of my query letter. And I just asked her if she would read it and give me her thoughts on the letter and the premise of the book. And then our discussion went from there. And that worked well for me because it kind of put us both at ease and she wasn't having to sit there and you know smile and listen to yet another. And so anyway, uh, by the time we finished talking, she said, "Okay, you know this is in my wheelhouse. Send it to me." And um, so I got back home and I took a week to go through it and polish as much as I could. Sent it off, and when she called me back a couple weeks later, she told me what she liked really quickly, and then she told me what wasn't quite working, which was a lot longer <laughs> list. And she asked if I would be willing to let her uh, share it with her assistant and together they could give me notes. And it there was no offer to represent me or the book at that point. I think understandably she wanted to see what I could do with those notes. And so they did, they got me a couple of pages, like a letter um, of kind of things they were looking for and questions they had. And I took about five weeks and completely panicked and went through all of that, but did manage to work through a pretty um, hefty revision. And once I sent that to her, she said, okay, we still have more work to do, but I would like to uh, represent the book and see if you know we can get it out in the world. And um, so she was absolutely pivotal. And I was so extremely fortunate, not just to meet her, but she, um, she always helps me bring my work to the next level. And um, and so once we went through a few revisions, uh, then she said, okay, I think it's time to, to put it out there and to some editors and see what we get. And, um, and we got very fortunate on the first round of people. There were some editors that were interested and, um, and I got really lucky and uh, it went to auction, which then I had an, an option. <laughs> uh, and I did end up going with uh, Celadon and I, I can't say enough about them and my experience so far. So in a really quick nutshell, that's, and of course, even once they bought the book, they had, there was another pretty um, strong revision. And uh, so it, you know, that went on for a while, but in any case, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, so yeah, it was very, very fortunate. Excellent, thank you. So Nicole, same same question to you. Um, you now have three books and I believe they've all been published by separate companies, is that correct? Close, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so the, the our three books, one was with one publisher and the other two were with another. Okay, so how did you, um, cause you do have a little bit of a different publishing, you're working with hybrid publishers. So that can sometimes be a little bit easier because you aren't waiting for an agent or, or a company to, yeah. you know, offer you something, you have a little bit more control, but tell us a little bit of your publishing journey. Yes, and I just wanna to say to Tracy, you did not get lucky, you're talented, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my, that is totally correct. So, uh, I wrote, um, my first 
full-length novel manuscript, which lives in a drawer. And I tell everyone that was my practice novel. I had to see if I could do it and see, you know, what I knew, what I didn't know. And then after that, I wrote The House of Bradbury and I started pitching agents. And I would say all in, it took about nine months to hear back from all the agents that I had pitched. Um, and they all said, no, you know, there's always the ones that never respond back. But at the end of the ninth month, there was an agent who didn't sign me, but she took the time to write me a chapter by chapter um, notes of why the book wasn't working. And she encouraged me to keep going. And so I did, I worked on it more. And at the same time, someone had introduced me to an all-female press, which was a hybrid. So that means I put some skin in the game. The publisher put some skin in the game. Um, they actually had pretty good distribution and they had a really nice um, book publicity arm. And they wound up reading my manuscript and signing me. And I actually really loved the experience because it was highly collaborative. Um, and then after uh, The House of Bradbury came out, um, I was lucky enough to get some press. It was in some magazines and things like that. And I had two literary agents come to me and offer representation for the next book. So I signed with one of them. And um, she, <laughs> my story is crazy. So I pitched her a book. She she took that book and put it on submission. And one of the uh, publishers, which is Lake Union, they're owned by Amazon. Amazon has a publishing house. I don't know if everybody knows that. Um, they contacted my agent and said, we don't want this story, but we want her. And I just thought, okay. <laughs> and so I actually flew to Seattle and met with them um, at the Amazon buildings and we talked it through. And I wound up signing a two book deal pretty much that day with them. And they paid me to write two stories and I had pitched one to them at the meeting. Um, and so that was a totally different experience, right? So that was going from small sort of collaborative to um, much bigger. Amazon's known as sort of a big marketing uh, wheelhouse. And so they have a little bit different focus. Um, my editors changed pretty much right when I got there. Um, I was kind of a small fish in a big pond, um, but it was a great experience. And yeah, totally different. So all the books had different experiences. Yeah, very cool. Um, and I love that Lake Union is, I mean, in for all intents and purposes, they are a traditional publisher. I mean, yeah. they're using distribution. You know, we're getting your books in the store the same way yeah. we order, you know, Tracy's book. So yeah. that's a really interesting crossover in that way. Um, since we're talking to a lot of people who maybe have not yet been published, although the Guild is putting out an anthology this fall, which will have quite a few of our members in it, and that could, you know is a publishing credit, we're we're very excited about that. Um, what's something that you wish someone had told you about publishing before you took the leap? And Nicole, you want me to answer first. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, and I actually, I love that question, Julie, and I was talking to somebody this morning about that. Um, I would encourage everyone, including myself, know your goals, identify your goals as a writer and stick to them. So I'll give myself an example. I was with that smaller experience in the beginning. I really enjoyed it. And then um, I had this dream. One of my goals was to have an editor that would be my older, wiser kind of mentor and help me through my career. And when Amazon came along with the shiny advance and the two to book deal, I sort of lost sight of my goals and said, I don't care. I've just, you know, I want to sign with them because I was so eager. And what happened was not what I, what my goal was. My goal, I didn't get that editor who would be my mentor. I got bounced around from editor to editor and I didn't have the experience that I told myself I wanted. And so I would just say, keep track of your goals. If you want to be collaborative and be like right there in the creative process and have a say, then follow that path. If you don't care and you'd rather hand it off and have, you know, another big group who is really established and wonderful, then that's your goal. But just keep track of that, of your wishes and your goals and um, stay true to yourself. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and Tracy, same to you um, with a different, you know, publishing path and, and Going with someone like Celadon, what is still something that you would tell anyone who's seeking, you know, publication? Um, I think this kind of relates to what Nicole said, but um, a big one 
I see again and again, and I'm remind, reminded of again and again, is to just take your time. Um, and I, I think that relates to keeping your personal goals in mind. Um, but I've, I've definitely seen, so, and I know so many people who are so anxious to make it happen. And uh, maybe they submit, you know, they query too early and uh, you kind of only get that one shot with agents and, um, and if it goes to an editor, you get that one shot. And uh, so I've seen a lot of that and, and uh, you know, I, a lot of people regret and just, I, that wasn't ready. I jumped the gun there. Um, but then also when you do get some interest, I, I also know a couple of people that were so um, anxious, so eager mm -hmm. for that interest that they ended up making a decision that didn't feel quite right at the time. I, you know, maybe they chose the wrong person and it didn't end up working out very well. Um, or they ended up with someone that really wasn't on the same page as far as what their um, ultimate goal was for their work. Um, so I, I, and even recently, I, I know someone who's so anxious to make it happen that uh, she jumped at the first offer from a, a respectable, but very small publishing house that kind of verges on more of the collaborative kind mm -hmm. that you're talking about, Nicole. And then, you know, I said, it doesn't sound like you're quite ready or you're not sure. And she went with it and two weeks later, she got that other um, offer, but it was kind of too late. So I, all of that to me is just about um, just keeping in mind as anxious as you are to make it all happen, to just remember your goals, like Nicole said, and take your time um, and really think through all of those decisions. Um, before you, before you jump at the first one. Yeah. So along the lines of making sure that the manuscript is ready, did you have, um, you know, you went through these writing uh, conferences and, and things, but did you have an editor or beta readers? Like how did you get it to that point where you felt confident in sending it to that agent? Uh, for me, I, one of the most fantastic things that came out of my writing program that I did through Stanford was the, my writer's group. Mm -hmm. I connected with other writers early on, found my group, and we still work together. It's been, you know, four years or so later, and we work together. And at this point, we know each other's work and our goals so well, and, but they were vital. I was able to workshop so much of that book with people. Um, and I, I also rely on my husband, right? He's, he's a great one to come in later and give me some great thoughts. And I have a couple other people, but I would say that, um, I don't know how anybody does it without a writer's group. And I'm sure there are people that are and do it successfully. Um, but I, I don't know how I would get through without that support and accountability and feedback. And cause you know, at times we all lose objectivity and we need those people to help us out. Um, so yes, I have a writer's group. I do have some beta readers I can lean on and they are to me are essential to my process. And I don't know that you ever feel like, oh, it's done. Right. <laughs> I don't know that that ever happens, but it finally got to the point where I thought, okay, I've kind of done what I can. And I, you know, the next, the next step is to see if there is a professional, an agent that, that sees the potential here. Yeah. Nicole, the same question to you, um, especially with, you know, like you were saying, going with collaborative um, publishers and then Lake Union, did you have anyone, you know, did you pay for editing before you submitted these manuscripts to a publisher? Yeah, hundred percent. I get a developmental editor for everything I do. And then I also have a couple beta readers who I'm really specific about. I don't just ask a good friend because it's hard for a good friend to give you advice. Mm -hmm. So I have people I know that just read voraciously and they're not afraid to give me, you know, answer specific questions. You know, along those lines too, because um, you, you know, you had people looking at this and, and Tracy, you mentioned this, you had an agent, you know, looking at this manuscript before there was anything in place. I've had several authors that I've talked with that I've worked with, or just, you know, we never got to that point, but still in conversation, very concerned about giving their manuscript to a beta reader, an editor, and that kind of thing, because 
they feel like, you know, is this person going to steal my, and I, I try and explain to them, I don't have the time to steal your, your manuscript and try and publish <laughs> it as my own. But what is, I guess, what is your advice in finding or, or kind of developing that relationship of trust with both an editor, your beta readers and your writing group? Because when you've written this, you know, whether it's a long form fiction, it's poetry, it's whatever, it's very personal. It, you know, I joke with a lot of my authors that you're, it's like growing a baby. Um, you know, you've put blood, sweat, and tears into it. So, um, I want to start Nicole with you because you do hire a developmental editor, but how did you kind of find that person and, and learn to trust them? Yeah, that's a great question. And people say that all the time. Well, I don't want someone to steal my title or my book or my concept or my premise. It's so true. By the time you've written this manuscript and by the time someone else gets it, they're not going to write the whole book overnight and then plagiarize it and sell it within the time, amount of time it takes for you to start pitching. So don't worry about that. Um, and then you said, how did I find my editors? Well, yeah, finding them, but also just... I mean, maybe if you talked with more than one, sorry, I'm going to get out of the sun, Yeah. but developing the, the rapport and the trust of all of these people that are going to look at your book, you know, before it's copyrighted and published or, you know, however right. people think of it that way. Right. So I always get a word of mouth, um, you know, just if before I met an editor, I always ask my other author friends who they recommend, especially they have to be in my genre and they have to enjoy my genre. Um, but let's say I read Tracy's book and I really excited and I want to know how she got to where she would, I would look in her acknowledgements page and read who maybe she thanked her editor and I could look into that because I trusted that work, you know, something like that. Um, but I would say all of mine were word of mouth and I just knew other, I got references and knew who they worked on. Um, and you do have to get that sample from them just so you are comfortable before you really dive deep in. So most editors will say, I'll do sample edits for five pages or 10 pages, whatever it is. And you can kind of see if the chemistry is there. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy, you know, you mentioned that you had the writing group and, you know, in that sense that can be probably maybe easier to establish like rapport and, and trust because you're all, you have the same goal in that program, but you know, handing off a manuscript to an agent without maybe like a contract in place, you know, was, were you, did you have nerves in that sense? No, I, um, especially because I was like at this conference where I did meet my agent, there were at least 20 different agents and editors that you could meet with. But I, I know people that met with at least half, half of them and just wanted to, you know, meet with everyone they could. I only picked out two. I, yeah. I kind of picked out two that I researched and I thought made sense for what, you know, represented the kind of books that I was working on. Um, so I didn't even have that thought that I, I was so happy she wanted it. <laughs> Here you go. Um, so yeah, I've never, as long as it's a reputable agent or, or editor, I, which is fairly easy, I think, to, to right. find online, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And as far as a writing group, that was easy for me too, because we were all in the same boat. You know, we all had yeah. come from different walks of life and careers, and but we were all trying to accomplish the same thing. And, and um, we're all swapping each other's work. We're all in the same boat. Um, so I can't say I really had that worry, but it, it's a good question. It's a good idea to research who you're going to approach and talk to and make sure. And there are, you know, I've definitely heard of some um, sketchy situations that someone maybe didn't do their research and and it's not real reliable so you do want to make sure but I think it's I don't think it's very difficult to make sure you're dealing with credible people but I I just uh, echo what Nicole said I do know people that have hired editors developmental editors I haven't but um they do their research but word of mouth is huge if you yeah. know another writer that's been really happy with someone it's a great place to start and there are quite a few websites out there that are watchdogs for unreputable what we now call kind of that vanity press that just want your money and and don't mm. really publish your book um but you bring up an interesting point about research so do you remember the books that this person had agented that that got your attention 
Um, well, when I found out she was going to be at the co- at the conference, I just kind of looked up, and I had I had seen her name and seen her books before, but um, yeah, there were at least a couple on there that just seemed to be right, kind of in the same vein as yeah. what I was working on. Um, so that felt good. And then you know, on their um, on the agency websites, they always talk about a little bit about who they are and what they're looking for, and um so you get just a a sense of that and uh that felt right to me but that's I think their their personal their agency websites where they talk about what's on their wish list and what they're keeping an eye out for is really helpful yeah and and it is um what I tell people is when you yeah when you're interested in an agent if you go and find a book that that a publisher would consider a comp, a comparable or a comparative title, Mm. find out who that publisher is, find out who that agent is. Again, like Nicole was saying, do they hopefully give their editor credit in the acknowledgement somewhere? Because that is, it's also really helpful in a pitch because that shows that you did the legwork to say, you published this author and this book which, uh, you know, is similar to my writing or on the flip side meets a need in your agency that you haven't published yet. You know, maybe Mm -hmm. it's similar, but it's, it's always different. So, um, I love that, that, that you did that. Um, so you having attended, uh, you were saying the Kauai writers conference, what's your advice for people about conferences like that? You know, um, kind of maybe maximizing because they're not they're not cheap they can be Mm -hmm. expensive Mm -hmm. to go to um but you know finding the right one you know how did you land on that one in particular uh for me part of the uh, appeal was just I knew a couple people that were going and that that made it comfortable for me that helped and we were kind of on the same stage in our process and Um, and it's very, it's pretty reputable. You can find it online and see it's how long it's been around and and who shows up every year. And, um, so that one was to me was kind of a no brainer. I mean, it was expensive. That part took some consideration, but as far as feeling like I would benefit from that experience, um, that it, it just right off the bat, I knew that would probably be a good, a good one. If nothing else, I would come away with all those connections and a lot of great information. Yeah. Um, so that's how, and that's the only one that I attended. I, one thing I do think is great now is, and I'm, a lot of this is due to COVID, but there's so much more virtual pitching now, mm-hmm. which I think makes it so much more doable for people. And the more you do it, um, once you feel you're ready to do that, the more you do learn and get some feedback. It's amazing that um, that one agent did that for you, Nicole. What a gift to um, take you through and give you that kind of feedback. That's really rare. So she obviously saw great stuff there. Um, but the more of it you do, the more you learn about the publishing world and what people are looking for and, and more about your own work. So I definitely encourage it once you're ready. Um, to, once you feel ready to talk about your book and, and, and the comps are huge. They always want to be able to put it in a box, you know, where, right. where does this one belong? So, yeah. Yeah. Nicole, what about you? What conferences um, have you attended over the years? I have, I think I was counting my head, I think four. So my first one was uh, San Francisco writers conference. And that still remains my favorite. Um, I walked into that room, I think it was like 2012, and the lobby was full of writers and editors and agents. And I was like, I found my people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That was a really nice mix of craft and marketing and business. On the flip side, I've also been to the Writers Digest Conference, which is in New York. And that Mm -hmm. was 99% marketing. And it it Mm -hmm. felt like not what I was looking for. I really Mm -hmm. was looking for a little more depth just to where I was in my career. Um, and I went to a giant pitch session there. It was like a huge ballroom full of agents and it was speed dating. And, um, the agents were pretty exhausted, you know, because they had to listen to like hordes of people. Um, and then the two that I really love are the ones that we have in our own backyard. I know Mike said that he was at Lamet, which I think 
Mike, I, I think you can pay per day. You don't have to pay for the whole yeah. thing, which I think is, yeah, that I think is huge. I think that's a great one. And then um, I've actually taught a couple classes at the Pacific Northwest one in Seattle. And I really liked that because it felt like everyone was really supportive. So it depends again, the goals, right? What are you looking for? You want craft or marketing? Do you want to pitch? Um, but it's worth it at least to go to one and virtually you can do them virtually now. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would highly recommend Willamette writers. Um, I've tabled at that one a couple of times for the editors guild and it's just, just the loveliest people putting it on. And then also so many people there that are, you know, the same thing they do agent pitching and you sign up for them. And I think you do have to pay, which makes sense because it's the agent's time. Yeah. And, um, you know, and again, it is, you know, Portland's only three hours from here and there's a couple, yeah, there's more than just PNWA in Seattle. I want to say there's also one called Emerald city. And then sometimes the romance writers one meets up there, but we are very lucky to have, you know, so many on this, in this area. Um, so I don't know how long um, we're, we're planning on keeping you. So I think we should go ahead and open it up to some Q&A from um, the people in the room. So what I will say is this, um, Paige or Mike, if you can help with the Q&A, because now that I'm on my phone, I can't see it as well. Um, but I'd love to open it up to um, the people in the room and everyone who's on Zoom um, to ask something that, I have missed because I know there's more <laughs> questions out there. Just shout it out. We can just sit in the little chair. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had the pleasure of seeing or reading either of your works or many works in the case of Nicole. And I just wonder if you could describe your work so we know what both genre and types of things you're writing about. Thanks. Let's have Tracy go first. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, it's hard to always pigeonhole. I think basically what I write is kind of contemporary fiction. And so far it's, I love to dive in a really messy, dysfunctional uh, families that um, make some really bad decisions <laughs> and dig deep into those relationships and um, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, so that's kind of my, my focus. Um, I will say this, having read Tracy's book, um, before we did her event, I want to see it made into like a Hulu <laughs> series because <laughs> it's exactly that, like it is, it's a messy family, but there's so much love and there's secrets and then you know, you find out stuff and, and it's so like therapy almost it's, it was very wonderful to read and, and it is messy, but beautiful. So Hulu should be giving you a call. I, I just, well, that you would know. be great. I'll let right? you know. <laughs> um, Nicole, how about you? And for Nicole's books, and I don't have a copy of it, but I second chance supper club is the one that I got to read before we did an event. And I loved it. I still have pictures of the book with my aunt and uncle's now, unfortunately not with us anymore dog because we were doing funny photos. And so I have him sitting in the grass next to your book, but Nicole, let us, uh, yeah, give us a little rundown of um, each of your books. That's so nice. Thank you. Okay. So I will, but just to the writers in the room, I'm going to tell you something I, Tracy already knows because I told her before, but Tracy's book does such a good job. If you ever want to know how to do backstory or flashbacks and weave them in a very natural, wonderful, wonderfully paced way, read her book because I, I just think it's a great example. So anyway, Thank it's a great you. story too. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So what's the question? So genre women's fiction. And so what that means, I know it's kind of a it's fraught, right? Women's fiction is mm -hmm. probably a category that will probably evolve and go away. But the reason I still use that is because to me, it's the internal journey of a woman. So she starts out uh, coming onto the page in her status quo, learns a lesson and has evolved by the end of the story. So that's really a good definition of what I write. Um, and yeah, the second chance supper club was a sister's story. So I definitely weave some, some sisters things in a lot of my books too. So did that answer all the questions? 
Yes, I would say also um, Second Chance Supper Club will make you very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much great food description that I'm just like, make it a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the Zoom audience? Oh, um, yeah, please. Hi, Nicole. Hi, good to see you. I was in Nicole's class this morning. It was wonderful if anyone wants to know. Um, you said this morning as well as um, in what you said this evening with the hybrid, you put some skins in and they put some skins in. How much skins are we talking? If we are looking at <laughs> working with, I, 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 we need to be realistic. If we're looking at um, working with somebody hybrid or hiring an editor, can you just give us some ballparks as to what that costs? Yeah, you know, what's so interesting is that book, I signed a contract in 2014, and I'm almost 100% positive that the, um, what their formula has changed and whatever they would charge you has changed. I have a feeling that I, I put money in that was probably a fraction of what it costs now. So I can't really speak for what today's market would do. Um, but I will say, no matter what path you go on, whether it's indie, which is, uh, you know, self-publishing or hybrid, or even if you go full traditional and you get an advance and you use a big chunk of that advance for a book publicist, it is a personal investment. It's like investing in a small business and it's really personal. It's, do you want this? Do you not? It's, it's up to you. You don't have to spend any money if you don't want it. Um, it, it varies per person, per contract. So I can't really speak to today's market, but I do know that most of my author friends put money in, in some regard, whether it's the end for marketing or the beginning for an editor or somewhere in between. Yeah. And I've seen a lot. So one of the authors that I work with who is also local and she self publishes, um, she had a, an indie a hybrid reach out to her um, and say, you know, I want to publish your next book. It was the beginning of a trilogy. We're about to start editing the second in that. And they had her pay a $600 uh, upfront fee, but that was to cover the advanced reader copies and printed copies when that time came. Unfortunately, this uh, publisher just got ahead of themselves. They wanted to try and publish a hundred books this year, which <laughs> no. And so she ended up emailing them back and saying, Hey, I want my money back. And they gave it back to her. Mm -hmm. So we ended up self-publishing the book with Leva Moss at Bright Light Graphics. Um, and I would say that with this author, just knowing what she has paid me and um, my business partner who does the copy editing and then Leva, she was... I, she was probably in for about five grand to, to self-publish. I would say if you're looking at just even an editor to get started with, I would put aside about $2,500. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's very person to person. Thank you. Yeah. Whoever's next, go on. Hi, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, aside from writing the book, what uh, expectations did the, um, have your publishers had for you in terms of marketing, in terms of launching? Uh, what have been some of the expectations that they've either made specific to you or maybe you have just felt that they expected? Should I feel that first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Let's see, uh, they, other than of course, just polishing and, and you know doing the revisions and working with them on that, getting it to a place where we all felt like it was ready to go. Uh, beyond that, um, I, I sort of got lucky, at least in my opinion, uh, because of COVID, I could not go on any tour. I didn't have to travel anywhere. I, there are people that told me I was missing out and. I didn't particularly feel that way. I did a ton of Zoom events. I talked to people all over the country, um, which is wonderful. Um, so I can't really speak to that. Uh, I, I wasn't asked to travel and do that, you know, and I know a lot of people are. So 
Um, the only thing they asked me to consider, um, uh, you know, to help with getting the word out was uh, coming up with a, just basically um, establishing a social media presence. I really didn't, I was on Facebook for family stuff and, and they were very, um, no pressure about it, but I said, sure. And I quickly came to enjoy particularly the book community on Instagram. Um, and uh, I know they were really critical in getting word out early for me, um, which was a huge help. Um, so honestly, beyond that though, I can't say that they've had any, um, any other expectations that I didn't expect or didn't, you know, it, it's, it was kind of simple. COVID made it kind of simple when my book came out. Thanks. Nicole, what about you since yours is a little different? Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say exactly what Tracy said in terms of polishing the book and doing edits that was expected. And by the way, the deadlines were tight, tight, tight. I think I had two weeks over Christmas to do a full round and that was, they were being gracious. <laughs> um, I would say they didn't expect me to do anything else, but also on the flip side of that, if you don't meet your sales numbers, certain publishers don't want to pick you up, up again for the next book. So there's this under, um, you know, underwritten or unspoken thing of, I think I need to market my book, you know, and I, I would say most of the authors I know, unless they got a gigantic advance and they were one of the top ones, you know, really put out there by their publisher, we all took a chunk of our advances and, and bought some marketing with that. So it wasn't told, you know, to us to do it, but it's just sort of known. Well, and Nicole, wouldn't you say, um, have you been more responsible for scheduling your events because it's not necessarily a, a publicist? Like when, excuse me, when I first uh, found out about Tracy's book, you know, I think I reached out to her publicist, <laughs> pardon me, and I do that a lot with the bookstore where there are times where up until a couple of days before the event, I haven't actually spoken with the author. It's been all, you know, in-house publicists, but you're one of those authors and, and we have so many at the store that I work with you. You know, we yeah. did your launch at Lemon Tree and it was, it was us, you know, it yeah. was one-on-one. -on -one. Totally. Yeah. And that's because I didn't get um, money to do a book tour. So I, you know, of course, local stuff I did on my own for sure. And like I said, it's, I cannot stress enough that whatever your path is, it, for me, my personal opinion, it is like launching a small business. Each book is like launching a small business and you have to decide where you want to put your energy and where you're willing to give. And that's definitely one of the places I put my energy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. More? Are there any online? No? Any other questions? Yeah, come on. Hi. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, it, I don't know where to look. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get the owl in front of you. They'll, right here? It'll appear okay. that you're looking at that. All right. <laughs> Speaking with the owl. Um, so um, I am an aspiring author, um, definitely have reached the place where I know I need a book coach. So um, entering this arena, I spent the morning actually this morning online looking at book coach options. Um, and what are, what would be your advice? What, what, what could uh, someone like me expect? Or what would be good questions to ask of someone I might be interested in um, coaching me? I think Nicole should take this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that this um, falls in line with what we were talking about with finding the right, you know, editor or someone you trust as a beta reader is you want the chemistry test first, right? So you need to either get on a phone call or get on a Zoom with someone you're considering after maybe you've looked into, done your research, looked into their website and maybe asked someone they work with word of mouth, but get online and have that chemistry test. Um, because you want to know if it's a good fit, if this, you know, when you meet a friend or a new friend on the street, you know, whether or not you're going to be friendly because you just have that chemistry or you don't. Um, and then I would also 
ask them, you know, do you edit and how do you edit? Do you do a sample edit so I could see how you work and maybe see yeah. what my reaction is to your edits? You know, it's, it's really a give and take. And if don't just go with someone because they impress you or because someone else used them and they said, oh, you have to use this person. Go with someone that makes you feel like this is the right thing for you. Um, and I would always start small. You know, sometimes I have people come to me, I have different packages and they want to do is kind of the higher ticket thing right off the bat. And nine times out of 10, I discourage them and say, let's start with the smallest thing first and just make sure that this is working for you. And then we'll lead up to that. Um, so just, yeah, look out for your best interest for sure. Thank you. I will say too, when you're looking into editors, um, this is for everybody in the room, there are a lot of editors who will offer what's called a manuscript evaluation, which is more like a professional beta read. So I do those and I'm reading the entire manuscript, not leaving any corrections on it, but I am sending you a 10 to 12 page note of what I think is working, isn't working, how it made me feel, where you could develop it more. Um, I will say I've been pretty lucky. A lot of the manuscript evaluations I do, the book is in very good shape, you know, then it's just minor cleanups, but that can really help you find not only the person you maybe want to work with, but also answer that question of where is my manuscript in the process? You know, does it need a complete developmental edit and overhaul or have you you know, worked on it yourself or with friends so many times that it's, it's pretty clean, you know, that manuscript evaluations and not all editors do them, but they're very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. We have any more? Cause I have one more question for each of the authors, but I want to give everybody in the room a chance. There's one question online too. So We'll go okay. Here. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm uh, more specifically interested in uh, memoir writing. Uh, so, I similar question to the person just just before me, but um, uh, in specifically for for memoirs in terms of uh, coaching and and editing or getting started. That's you, Julie, right? It kind of is. Um, so I actually specialize in editing memoir and it's for a couple of reasons. One, um, I read them. I, I read a lot of them. I have for years when they were still called autobiographies. Um, and I read a lot of self-help. And so one of the reasons that I got into editing memoir is um, first, it, it was word of mouth. One of the very first books that I worked on professionally was a memoir of a gal in her 30s who had lost three of her family members to opioid overdoses and it was just it was that time when we started seeing that more in the news and she really wanted to get it out and um it clicked between the two of us and then it also just clicked with me editing memoir because like I said I've read so many and I think I'm up to I think I've edited professionally 10 memoirs now. And so I've gotten really used to talking with people, um, especially with, you know, you get the sample and you're doing that first date of, you know, what, what are their expectations? What are mine? But finding out is this memoir, is it the history of your life that you just want, you know, to be able to tell all the cool things that you've done over your, your amazing life? Or are you wanting to get a message out to other people who are struggling with something similar, like in the case of this woman and the opioid, you know, epidemic of using memoir as a therapy, almost, you know, memoir as self-help. So that's one of the ways that it has worked out for me as an editor is like, I read them and I get something out of them too. And so I just keep find people keep finding me with their memoirs and I love it. If I could just add one thing, whether it's memoir or fiction, or I just, this is basically what Nicole was saying too, but um, it's just finding someone that gets what you're trying to do and, have, can, and you have a shared vision for that. Pro and that comes to whether, when you have an opportunity to, to choose an agent and eventually an editor and a public, you just want to make sure that you, you all kind of share that same vision and they can help you get there. Yeah, for sure. 
So the um, Central Oregon Writers Guild website has a page called Writers Resources that lists local members uh, who are who do editorial work and coaching and all that sort of stuff. And I totally agree with what's being said here is um, most people will do a consultation with you. So go have a cup of coffee with them and talk to them and yeah. tell them what you're, what you're after. And I mean, that's the start is, is to do that. And Nicole will get your information on that site too. Um, but, but I think the, the idea is that everybody has a sort of a different idea of what they want to have happen. And hopefully you're talking to someone who can find that avenue for you and share with you what is actually going on out there in the world, right? Um, and how you may be able to access it. And there's a, a, a million ways to get published. So um, yeah, do your research. Don't, don't just jump in with somebody that you're not comfortable with, so. Other yeah, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, authors. So this question is coming from the chat from Andrew, actually a featured reader, and he asked, Rough estimate, how long did it take for you to complete your first draft? Um, let's see, uh, the first draft of Brennan's took about, first draft, <laughs> oh, sorry, there were a lot of drafts. So, uh, okay, I would say about, it took about a year and that included a break of, a good three to four months where I stepped back and worked on something else for a little bit. Um, and obviously went through so many evolutions after that, but I would say close to a year with that break in the middle there. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the same. I would say for all my books, the average is eight months to write the first draft and then maybe three or four months to do edits. So around a year. But there's no right or wrong. I mean, you can yeah. take 10 years if you want. Yeah, right. lots of people do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, do we have any more questions from the room or online? Because I have one final for each of you. Good All right, um, and I think for sure Tracy knows this one because I did it to her on her event, but Nicole, our event was so long ago. Can you recommend and this can be your all-time favorite book or something you currently read, but I want your your like three book recommendations from each of you. So um, let's start with Tracy. Okay, sorry, <laughs> just jumped in there. <laughs> um, I would say when I think about the books that at least were so important to me, uh, one is Wally Lamb's, I know this much is true, it just, timing. I read it 20 years ago, probably, and huge impact on me. Um, also, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt was a huge one for me. Um, and gosh, it's, I would say really anything by Ann Patchett is also, <laughs> um, particularly love The Dutch House, more recent one. So those are three uh, all-time favorites. Yeah. Nicole, what about you? Okay, that's so hard. <laughs> I know, it really is. What, really what are you reading right now, Nicole? Are you um, reading anything fun? Yeah, I'm actually reading uh, 123 by Lori Frankel. Mm. Um, so I read a lot of female authors. My favorite, all time favorite author is Sue Monk Kidd. So she wrote The Secret Life mm. of Bees. Um, she's written so many beautiful spiritual books. And then, um, you know, the book that made the most impact on my whole sort of love of books was To Kill a Mockingbird, which mm -hmm. is very standard, but I'm never going to give that up. So okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, it, that's so hard. I saw Tracy looking at her bookshelves. I was like, oh my gosh, that's too much I pressure. I know. <laughs> I know. I should have sent that to you both so that you could, you could ponder on it. Um, are either of you working on new projects for publication? Yeah, I, I have one will be out next year. Um, awesome. Yeah, just went through final edits on that. I think I'm about done with that uh, portion of it. Um, and then I just keep going. I've got a couple other things I'm working on. And so hopefully they'll, they're going to want to keep publishing them. <laughs> we'll see. But Excellent. Um, Nicole? Well, Tracy, is, do you have a title or no? Yeah, the one coming out next year is called The Connellys of County Down. In fact, they just presented the um, 
final design cover to me today, which was super exciting because I'm not good at That's that. Good. I had no idea what they were going to do. So, yeah. Oh, so exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, I am working on something as well. I haven't touched it in two years. I wrote it at the very beginning of COVID. And um, I just hired a book coach, a fellow book coach that I adore. And um, she's helping me do all the edits. So we're going to give that back to my agent when we're ready. And my agent's on a very long maternity leave. So I have some time. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I suppose that means that everyone who is uh, here for these for this event is going to need to come to book events at Roundabout with both of these authors when <laughs> their books are available, because we will definitely be doing that. So um, awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, Mike, do we have anything else for Tracy or Nicole? Questions or no? All right. No. Um, thank you both very much yes. for coming. And Julie, thanks for facilitating. Um, this has been enlightening. Appreciate it. It's great to have uh, famous people in, in Bend here that we get to, to hang out with and listen to. And we'll look forward to your next books. And Nicole, you've got a, a, another workshop on the 19th, it looks like, uh, at Roundabout too. So, yeah. All right. So, we um, here in this room are going to party down. Um, <laughs> we've got snacks and, and chatting and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, those of you at home can just be jealous of that. Um, <laughs> and we'll see you next month. And again, um, check out the website if you're looking for editorial services or uh, coaching or whatever uh, locally. I mean, there's obviously people all over the world that do that. Um, and uh, that September writing workshop is something to take a look at too here. Uh, that's going to be in person here at the library, September is something. But take a look at that and, and feel free to sign up. And otherwise, we'll see you next month at our next meeting with Erica Berry. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Tracy you. and Nicole. Bye, Thank Mike. you so much. Thank you, Julie. All right. Thank Bye. you. All right. Talk soon.